Dylan Rounds grew up in Rigby, Idaho, where his parents, Candice Cooley and Justin Rounds, lived. However, when he was four years old, his parents divorced, so he spent most of his time between Twin Falls and Idaho Falls. It was also said that Candice had very little to no contact with the kids for a few years after the divorce. While Dylan never seemed to have a problem with his parents separating or that he spent most of his time in different homes, he was a determined young boy who knew what he wanted in life. During Dylan's time at Rigby High School, his life was quite unique in many ways. As a teenager, he didn't really play video games, he didn't date, and he wasn't a very social person either. Although he did not have many friends of his own age, he was well liked by his classmates. Aside from that, he wasn't interested in returning to college because he already knew what he wanted to do after school. Dylan's biggest dream was to become a farmer, and his grandfather encouraged him so much. As soon as he graduated from high school, Dylan moved to Utah. There, he had the plan of taking over the farming operation that his grandfather had left behind. A 640-acre piece of land was purchased, and it was Dylan, who would give life to this land. It was a raw piece of land in the middle of the Utah desert, in the small town of Lucin, which was listed as, one of Utah's ghost towns. Montello, Nevada, is probably the nearest place to go, but it's still a half-hour drive. And as Dylan's primary spot, Montello would be his regular stopping place for gas, or for a hot bite at one of the two small cafes in this small town. Whether Dylan ate at the cowboy bar or cooked his frozen pizza at the saddle saw bar and grill, it was pretty much the same. They are both owned and operated by the same family. And in fact, currently, they do not serve food, but because he was a family friend, they let him cook his pizzas there. It is also possible that Dylan will spend the night in Montello. He will, however, sleep in a friend's vacant mobile home and then make his way home in the morning. In short, Dylan knew it would be a long and hard road to prepare the desert soil and clear the sagebrush on the property. However, he was ready for the challenge. Upon arriving in Utah, Dylan lived alone in an RV on the property. Occasionally, he would hire a few workers for help here and there, mostly people from Dylan's grandfather's old work group. And after two years of preparing the land, it was late May of 2022, and Dylan was super excited about his first crop of the year. It was meant to be a grain and feed farm for local animals. But the day before, on May 25th, Dylan was so annoyed and frustrated when he called his mom. He told her that Chase Venstra, 41, flagged him down when he was driving down a gravel road. He was erratic, barefooted, and asked for his phone, then asked for a ride. During the phone calls, Dylan mentioned that Venstra seemed strange and intoxicated, so he decided not to take him. However, later, Venstra was spotted in Montello, where he said he indeed got a ride to Dylan's trailer. He also said the two knew each other, which contradicts Dylan's calls to Candice. Then on the 26th, Dylan was spotted in Montello using his bank account. He also called his parents on this day. Also in Montello, Dylan was last seen eating at the Saddlesaw Bar on the 27th of May. The next day, on the 28th, Dylan's grandmother called him, at 6.51 in the morning to ask what he planned to do that day. Despite answering the call, Dylan cut the call short because it was about to rain, and he had a truck full of seeds, that he couldn't let get wet. He had a pickup truck that he used, to travel between his barn and the shed, about five miles from where his RV was parked. But that evening, he never returned his grandmother's calls, which concerned her. So in the morning of the 29th, she called some farm workers to check on him, but to no avail. She then called his parents, in the early hours of May 30th, to ask if they had heard from or seen Dylan. At that point, Dylan's parents realized that they had not heard from him in the past two days, and both decided to drive to Lucin, hoping to get an answer. 
After they arrived, Dylan's truck was parked next to the RV that he was living in, all by himself, but he was nowhere to be found. But they became more worried, when they noticed the truck was locked up, and Dylan didn't actually use to lock it. The truck was usually old and beaten up, and it was Dylan's primary vehicle for getting around the farm, desert, and nearby town. It was also in four-wheel drive mode, which Dylan did not use for this particular reason, as the setting did not work on his truck. When the family was unable to gain entry to the truck, they broke the window, and they could smell foul play. As Dylan's seat was moved forward, his mother noticed that it is usually farther back since Dylan was 5'11". After a few minutes, they decided to call the sheriff of Box Elder County, the county where Lucin is located. They came and took a look at the property and made a report. But Dylan is a grown man, who lives by himself, in the middle of nowhere, so at first, they treated the case with ease. Just fill in a missing person report and give it a few days, he might just pop up from nowhere. After the initial search, they were sure that Dylan's phone, wallet, and the handgun he always carried, were all missing. There was a search for about an hour and a half when someone came across a pair of boots that had been thrown behind a dirt pile. At first glance, Dylan's parents identified these boots as belonging to Dylan, and his mom was immediately concerned. That is mainly, because, on Friday, the day before Dylan vanished, those boots weren't in that desert when it rained. The boots didn't even have dust or mud on them. A total of 300 search volunteers searched on the Utah side of the river, including five private air searches, until they ran out of fuel, but Dylan wasn't found. In the beginning, the investigation was not considered a criminal investigation, so Dylan's truck was not fingerprinted. But on the 14th of June, it was taken into police custody in Bonneville, for processing. Authorities then noticed the truck had been pressure washed, as it was noticeably clean. There was no mud on the tires, or the rims, but there is mud in the wheel wells. Dylan may have left and returned, but there would have been markings on the ground either way. A few days later, on June 18th, a phone belonging to Dylan was also found at the bottom of a pond. And based on his call history, he made several calls, one of which stood out, to Jim Brenner. As a matter of fact, Brenner was Dylan's last contact. Dylan called Jim Brenner right after his grandmother's call, on the 28th. Then Dylan showed up at Jim Brenner's, the phone did, and hung around for a long time. Then the phone went back to Dylan's and then back to Jim Brenner's. He was at the pond when Dylan disappeared, and his phone was found in the pond where he had been sitting. Candice is also worried about someone entering Dylan's trailer after he disappeared and placing one of his guns, along with a key fob to his truck, inside. When Dylan's parents went to his house after he went missing, they carefully looked through Dylan's camp trailer for his gun. Candice says there was no gun in it, and when they opened the medicine cabinet, they found nothing. The next day, Justin's sister cleaned out the bathroom for Dylan's grandma to use. There was no gun in there. Upon returning to the trailer the following day, Dylan's parents reported that the truck key fob was placed in the same location as the gun. The key fob was wiped down, and police were not able to get any fingerprints off it. This key fob and gun were not originally present. They were returned, and placed back under everyone's hats. And in July, the FBI focused its attention on Chase Venstra, 41, and James Brenner, 59. These men committed felony gun crimes in Utah in the days leading up to Dylan's disappearance. While Brenner admitted that he moved Dylan's bloody boots, he did not say anything else about his sudden disappearance. Besides Brenner's phone logs, it was also obvious that Brenner was in the pond in the days leading up to and after Dylan's disappearance. Dylan's parents, believe Brenner, 
who was squatting on a nearby property at the time of Dylan's disappearance, knows what happened to Dylan. Even so, no charges have been filed against him. In Utah, Brenner was charged with three counts of being a restricted person in possession of a firearm, and he has not returned to the property. A few days after Dylan disappeared, Candice and Justin, along with law enforcement, watched Brenner spend time in a shed near Brenner's camper. A recent visit by Cooley and Rounds revealed that the shed was filled with trash, and empty beer cans. Apparently, Brenner pulled the grain truck out on his own and cleaned it. He was cleaning the shed with law enforcement, and they were watching him. Brenner took four garbage bags and put them in the back of his pickup, but no one actually stopped him. In Cooley's opinion, he was not cleaning up garbage that day but rather hiding whatever he took out of those bags under the noses of law enforcement. And despite maintaining he had nothing to do with Dylan's disappearance, Brenner remains in the Weber County Jail. Moreover, when Dylan's grandmother called Brenner out about the gun, the boots, and the shed. And he said, well, I can't talk to you anymore, you will have to talk to my lawyer. A statement that raises even more red flags. There was also an allegation, even though it has not been verified directly by law enforcement or the source. The allegation is that Kurt Wadsworth, who occasionally worked on the farm with Dylan, claimed that Chase Venstra had kidnapped Dylan and was keeping him in a place in Montello. First of all, we know he was a friend of Dylan's, even though he is in his 60s and Dylan is just 19. According to Jim Terry, a private investigator hired by Dylan's family, Kurt and Dylan have been dating. Others have called this preposterous. And I actually find it odd that someone would publicly state such a thing without proving it. To further make the story more bizarre and troubling, Kurt has a brother in the area named Troy. A brother with a lengthy criminal record, one that involves talking and sex crimes. Troy Wadsworth, the owner of the Cowboy Bar and Café, and the Saddle Saw Bar and Grill. In fact, one story says Troy had kidnapped two women, removed their shoes, and kept them captive in a building near Montello. But in any case, Dylan's parents immediately contacted authorities about Kurt's tip in which they told them to contact Nevada law enforcement as Montello is technically in Nevada, and they couldn't help it. They then contacted Elko law enforcement, who had no idea that there was even a missing person in Lucin. That meant that the police in Box Elder County did not tell the police in Elko, even though Montello is the closest town to Lucin, and it is known that Dylan often went there. Eventually, Elko detectives located the property Chase was supposed to be keeping Dylan on, but they could not find him. Chase was also very adamant that he had nothing to do with Dylan's disappearance, either. He had an alibi for the period in which Dylan allegedly went missing, but he also had an outstanding warrant for an unrelated crime, which subsequently led to his arrest. We also learn that one of the farmhands who worked with Dylan was fired shortly before he vanished. This man, Don, had been one of his grandfather's employees before working with Dylan. For the first couple of weeks as news of Dylan's story hit the media, Don initially took the most heat. He was recently fired, and he is much older than Dylan and not thrilled to have been hired for a 19-year-old. But others have said that despite Don and Dylan not always getting along enough to work together, they parted ways amicably. Even some who know Don personally have said he is a good guy and would never do anything to Dylan. Even stranger is that Robert Aviles, a friend of Chase, is involved. Robert was identified as the person accused of holding Dylan hostage at his mother's home, but it turned out to be a false report based on psychic information. However, Robert is still in police custody for unrelated charges. Candice says, search crews, family, and friends have done a thorough search of Round's property and around Lucin to the Nevada border. Utah officials have been helpful, and now she hopes the focus can shift to Nevada. The family thinks Dylan was taken to Nevada, and he did not leave his place willingly. As this case picked up momentum, 
law enforcement took a serious look. As recently as this month, the FBI joined the case along with the Utah Department of Public Safety. The Rounds family is offering $20,000 to anyone who finds Dylan or knows where he might be. And if you have any information on his whereabouts, call the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office. The family is also posting updates on the Find Dylan Rounds Facebook page.